Welcome to my review and thoughts of 2010 movie Red Hill. So I'm going to start by telling you this was a movie I absolutely loved. This video will have some jokes and I will get into some serious topics. This was requested by longtime subscriber and frequent commenter Arts Cafe. Dude, you keep suggesting stuff that I really enjoy. You know, Mandalorian, which I absolutely love. Rogue One, which I love a lot of. Solo, which I love some of. And, you know, I didn't love all of Book of Boba Fett, but it certainly was an interesting viewing experience. So, thank you. And, right, if you are looking for a review that talks about, oh, the movie doesn't really hold up, it's been outdone by later movies, because of that it's not that much fun to watch today, whether you agree with that assessment or not, this is not that review. So, I realize this video is long, I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. I start this video with a review where if I spoil anything, I will verbally warn before I do so and hold up an index finger until I'm done with the spoilers. You can mute and skip ahead and you see me lower my index finger as soon as I end the review itself and get into the thought sections. Please note the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers, including discussing the ending. Now, this movie is rated R, including for strong language, and yeah, I will probably also swear in this video for those bothered by that. And yeah, it uses its rating well. Like, this is not one of those movies where it's just pointless that, you know, some, some R-rated movies, you might as well just remove a little of the harsher material, make it a PG-13, this is a movie that needed to be an R. It could not deliver what it does without it. And, yeah, so I am quite a fan of Westerns. Uh, you know, there's a lot that I haven't watched, I will admit. But, you know, anything that I could get my hands on of Sergio Leone's, you know, and... Yeah, and, and, you know, this movie is in part a sort of revisionist Western. This is one of those movies that comments on what, you know, on, on Western tropes. And that is also, I, I really love movies like that. Uh, Unforgiven is one of my all-time favorite movies. I have only watched this movie once, and I just got done watching it and then started recording this video. And as far as I can tell, the version I watched was the original. There's supposed to be, like, one that trims out some of the, the violence and such. And as far as I can tell, that was not the one I watched. So, the plot... A, yeah, I'm to be... Puts it, a young police officer must survive his first day's duty in a small country town. And, yeah, that's... That's that's a good sort of doesn't tell you too much, and yeah, this is set in Australia present day. So though it is in part a western, it's not old west so much as present South Pacific, and that brings us to the writing. So this is a solid screenplay. Um, Patrick Hughes wrote, directed, and edited this, and you can really tell, like, there is a very clear, like, unity of vision here. The, the, just, yeah, it's, it's very, very impressive. The, the, let's see, right, so some, um, yeah, one, one critic does say, I wish Hughes had given just another pass for a script, fleshing out some characters and situations just a little more, giving slightly more thought to some scenes. He felt the conclusion was anticlimactic in the way it was shot. Anticlimactic, not anticlimatic, which means you are against the weather. But yeah, there, there is some, some truth to that. I... I was very happy with the, the writing. I felt like it gave just enough for, for each character. Like, every character that needs to be distinct is. Like, I could, you know, yeah, I could go into detail about every major character in this. And, yeah, it's it does an incredible job with setup. Like, um, I guess it's the first 20 or 30 minutes. Basically set everything up. And from then on, it's just non-stop, like, tension and suspense. It's, it's not like, 
a major action movie, but I agree with those who say that it is somewhat of a horror movie. So, uh, moving on to the direction. So once again, Patrick Hughes, and this, yeah, I I will just very briefly go over. Basically, before this, he had just directed. Let's see, yeah, he directed three shorts, two of which I was able to watch: The Lighter, which is fine, and Signs, which is legitimately quite good. And after this, he went on to make to direct The Expendables 3, which I think he did a very, very good job on. Let's see, he... Um, right, and he is both writing and directing... Let's see, okay, it's, it's called The Raid. It says it's based on the concept from The Raid Redemption. I mean, it sounds to me like it's an American... Uh, yeah, it's a, yeah, it's an American remake of... The original, which was, I will have momentarily, the original, I'm supposed to say it's somewhere around here, uh, let's see, Indonesian, right, yeah, the, the original The Raid is Indonesian, and yeah, uh, I'm not usually a fan of American remakes, but I might actually watch it, he's directed the Hitman's Bodyguard and Hitman's Wife's Bodyguard and the Man from Toronto, but he hasn't actually written, you know, yeah, he's, let's see, it's in pre-production, so he has written The Raid and he wrote this and the three shorts, but other than that, he hasn't written the movies he's directed. I haven't watched, you know, this and Expendables 3 are the only two movies by him that I've watched. I would like to. I, I certainly remember noting, you know, there's some great moments in the trailer for Hitman's Wife's Bodyguard. Probably also for Hitman's Bodyguard, but like Hitman's Wife's Bodyguard gives, as, as far as I can tell from the trailer, gives Salma Hayek a bigger role, and I think that really makes a huge difference. Like, obviously I love Samuel Jackson, we all do. Ryan Reynolds, under the right circumstances, can be incredibly funny. And and charming, good in action and such. But Salma Hayek, like you, if you unleash her, you are really dealing with something amazing. So, yeah, uh, I I might watch those. I I am afraid I currently don't have access to the, you know, either of the Hitman's Bodyguard movies or the 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 Man from Toronto. But yeah, um, right. And apparently, like. They're not incredibly well rated on IMDb, but, it, I mean, yeah, this one has a 6.3, Hitman's Bodyguard has a 6.9, so, and Expendables 3 has a 6.1, so, so that is perfectly acceptable, in, in my opinion. So, this movie is Ozploitation, or Australian-made exploitation movies. So just a few days ago, I rewatched Gone, the 2006 movie, not to be confused. There's like three or four movies called Gone. And uh, yeah, also Ausploitation. So yeah, briefly, uh, and, and you know, it hasn't been that long since I last watched Daybreakers. I remember it very well, so I didn't need to rewatch that one. So real quick, Worst to best, and all three of these movies are very good. Other than this movie, Ausploitation that I've watched, Gone, Daybreakers, and Mad Max 1. Now, Gone shows how isolated parts of Australia can get. There's a real grit, strong sense of place, haunting sense of isolation. Being exposed to part of the country that is still untamed and wild hasn't been turned into modern society or the very border between the two. Sometimes parts that... It's, it seems like nature is reclaiming. It seems like you could get lost in these places in more ways than one. Its strength lies in the editing, cinematography, and acting more than writing. This one has those same strengths, but also good writing. It has more than a handful of shots where flies land, crawl, take off from faces of living people, which is probably something that just happens in that hot nature, but it does really fit the film. And let's see... Yeah, and, and for sure, like, this movie also... I, I haven't watched enough Australian cinema to say for sure if this is 
a theme in all of them, but certainly, you know, Mad Max also does this. I mean, Daybreakers, I, it's been a while, but I'm almost certain Daybreakers is set in America, so that one doesn't really go for, and, and in, like, big city, although, no, actually, that one does also have some, like, places out in the country, I'm pretty sure it's, it's set in America, anyway, but yeah, um, you know, this movie, Mad Max Gone, you know, they, they show some of the isolated parts of Australia, and there is this sense of being exposed to part of the country that is still untamed and wild, and yeah, I mean, you know, I, I've i never been to Australia, but I do understand, like, yeah, you know, there are some of these small towns, this, this movie is set in a small town, some of these small towns are close to just nature, you know, and that is something that, like, I can understand why there might be a tension there for, I'm, I'm not going to speak to, you know, have, having not been there myself, but I could imagine there is maybe some tension there for the people who live in towns in Australia, maybe also cities, the that you know it's it's kind of there's a there's a there's an inherent sense of like you know we know that nature is dangerous especially in again you know hot climates such as that you know so yeah you could you could really see how the yeah i and i really appreciate that these movies explore that because it gives them a very distinct non-American identity, which is very good because, you know, at the end of the day, like, these are movies that could, like, there are American movies that are reminiscent of Gone. You know, I, I don't know how many of them use, like, nature and, and like, being, um, you know, they're, they're basically, like, their car stops working, uh, you know, in, in this area that's much more nature than, like, modern society, and, you know, an American one, like, yeah, off the top of my head, some American ones that resemble it are much more city, you know, yeah, there's the city-based single white female, there's the urban, ah, uh, suburban based The Hand That Rocks the Cradle, but all three movies are about, like, a, you know, a, a dangerous person coming close to people who are just living and trying to live a normal life, basically, you know. So, so it has some American elements as well. And like I mentioned, this is very much like an Australian interpretation of a Wild West movie. And I suppose Mad Max, that might be. No, yeah, yeah. There are there are American, yeah, because it's it's essentially this post-apocalyptic thing. But again, it has a very clear, very distinct Australian identity. Now, let's see. Yeah, and, and Gone is a movie that suffers from convenient, downright contrived writing, which is, of course, easier than not convenient, downright contrived writing to write and can be very frustrating to watch. I've seen some people say that this movie has convenient and contrived writing. I disagree. I can't really get into my interpretation of it without spoiling, so I will talk about it in the spoiler sections. So, for Patrick Hughes' work on The Expendables 3, he's described by other people who made the movie with him as detail-oriented and focused. Antonio Banderas said that Patrick was almost as chatty as Banderas' character, but not quite, which is very funny, and, yeah. And... Yeah, certainly, you know, you can you can tell like there is a very real grit to you know the overall. I do love all three Expendables movies. I'm not going to claim that they're like masterpieces of cinema, but they do what the you know does what it says on the tin, and I appreciate that. They're not like tricking people into watching something that's bad by you know saying, "Oh, look what we have here," you know. But there was a, um, you know, the, the first two do struggle with this, like, there's, there isn't as much grit. 
the the I'm, I'm not saying there's no I'm not saying that they those two movies have no grit but they don't feel as like what's the word like they're not quite as grounded and not every movie needs to be but I do think that the third movie is better for being more grounded and gritty than the first two. There's more a sense of danger. There's more a sense of, no, like, good guys might actually die, you know, which is, I, I realize that was one of the appeals of the 80s movies that, you know, the Expendables movies are sort of making tribute to, hearkening back to. I just don't think it's super interesting today to make, like, not, not if you're not going to do anything with it, you know. It's fine to do retro movies, but if you're not going to play around with things, if you're just going to recreate, it's not as interesting. Anyway, so... Right, and The Lighter and Signs, uh, two of the three shorts Patrick directed before this, are available legally for free right here on YouTube. And let's see, yeah, and and um, I guess by now it's been a week. I meant to do this video sooner, but there were issues with the streaming service. But yeah, I rewatched Expendables 3 like a week ago, and yeah, you know, I I haven't been able to, to determine if it's this movie or the three shorts or what exactly that got... Patrick Hughes, the directorial chair on Expendables 3. Oh, right, right. Uh, uh, Wikipedia says it was the short Signs, which, yeah, that it has a very distinct personality and sense of identity, which is something you look for. You know, there's a, there are some directors out there who are immensely talented, but they have no personality, and it's just not as much fun to watch a movie that... Yeah, I mean, it does what it's supposed to, I guess, but it has no personality, so... And, yeah, it's, it's, the, the, it's very impressive that, you know, this as the very first feature, and then Expendables 3 is only the second movie he does, like, there's a lot of elements in that movie, and they freaking work, like, it's, it's very, very impressive. And let's see. Yeah, and, and a brief ranking. I think each Expendables movie is better than the ones before it overall. And let's see. It's, it's, you know, I was a little worried that, you know, Expendables 3 is, you know, it's almost two hours long. Like the credits start an hour and 56 minutes in, which. Is kind of ridiculous for a movie that simple, you know. I've th this movie isn't at all overlong, so I think it likely has to do with the script for that one, which he did not write. And let's see, yeah, and and you know, Expendables three, there are like the action in it are confined to to chunks, and then there are chunks with absolutely no action, this, you know, Red Hill does a much better job, you know, pacing. And, let's see, and, and yeah, you know, Expendables 3 is the, one of the three that comes the closest to being, like, a real movie. It sort of has character introductions, arcs, a plot, like, and, and, again, ultimately, you know, certainly some of that is from the screenplay, but Patrick Hughes makes it work, you know, he, he completely understood the screenplay and he knew how to make it work, and that's, yeah, and, and you know, to, to be clear, you know, according to the behind the scenes on the DVD of Expendables 3, some of the action was shot by second unit, which, you know, and the second unit had substantially more, um, what's the word, like, um, experience doing action movies, action scenes, but, like, a lot of it was directed by Patrick Hughes. And, let's see, and, and it's also, like, Mel Gibson's villain, like, Mel Gibson is a piece of shit in real life, unfortunately, but he is still a very, very talented actor. He, he does a really, really solid job, and that's, again, like, Patrick Hughes 
gets out of Mel Gibson's way. He just lets this incredibly talented actor act, you know, and that's a sign of a director who, like, comparatively, um, let's see, I think it was, ah, uh, what's it called? It was one of the Halloween sequels. I think it was the sixth one, uh, you know, the, the one with Paul Rudd. No, seriously, look it up. Um, in that one, apparently on the commentary track, like, the director is talking about how boring he thinks... Boring? How boring he thinks that the returning actor from most of the Halloween movies, Donald Pleasance, is, you know. And apparently... I haven't listened to the commentary track myself, but I read a review by someone who did, and apparently, like, he tried to trim down Donald Pleasant's scenes as much as possible, not realizing that he's by far the most talented actor in the thing, which is no diss on Paul Rudd. It was early in his career. Yeah, um... That's a case where that director should have checked his ego and been like, you know what, maybe it's not my kind of thing. There's a reason Donald Pleasant was brought back for basically, all, like, I th is the only one that he's not in, you know, before he died, which, you know, pretty difficult for him to rep reprise the role after that point. He was in all except the third, and that one isn't in continuity with the other, so there was there wasn't any room for him to be in that. I don't know, I guess he could have been in another role, but I think they wanted to make it clear that it was different. And and to be fair, it does bring back some of the cast from the first two. But but yeah, you know, Patrick Hughes, despite being you know, he's he's one of the youngest people working on Expendables 3. And he gets it, you know, he's like, you know what, the reason this movie's even being made is because these people were incredibly impressive when I was a child, so I am not going to, like, impose my, you know, I'm, I'm going to let them do their thing, because that's why we're here. And, let's see, right, and the, the... Yeah, so Antonio Banderas is very funny in the movie, outside of the Benghazi reference that comes out of the blue. I'm not sure I would say this movie really does have any, like, one character that's just, like, very funny, but I don't think it would really work. It's a, it's a fairly dark movie, this one. And, let's see, yeah, some of the, the cast are wasted in Expendables 3. I wouldn't really say anyone's wasted in this. Like, it realizes, you know, okay, so Steve Bisley and Tommy Lewis, RIP, you know, incredibly talented. So let's give them some screen time. And, you know, some of. I, I wouldn't say there's any. There's no bad actor in this movie, but the. the yeah, they are the two, you know, two really, really compelling actors so yeah now but but yeah um he has a very firm grasp on tone and genre and Petra Cruz does and there is a like it's very clear he understands what is the appeal of the western and yeah Let's see, and, oh, right, so I have some IMDb trivia. It was such a cold shoot that half the cast wore wetsuits underneath their costumes, which, yeah. And they, like, they didn't let that show at all. That's the kind of thing that can make it very, very difficult to give a strong acting performance, but they are incredible. Tommy Lewis shot to fame over 30 years earlier in Fred Schipisi's The Chant of Jimmy Blacksmith. Let's see, right, and and uh, I don't know. I guess I feel like that's a spoiler. I'm gonna go ahead and put that with the spoilers. Now, uh, let's see. right. The production company didn't have access to a rain machine, so the local fire brigade fire. 
Brigade, the Country Fire Association of Victoria, was paid in beer to hold a hose over a scene being filmed so as to replicate raining, which, that's, yeah, you know, that's, that's thinking with your head, and the, the, yeah, it is legitimately, like, it really works, like, I, it's, I knew that when I watched the scene, but it's still, like, it's not, like, distracting. And, yeah, they shot it in 24 days, July and August of 2009. And it was privately financed for just 700000 Shot and edited before the producer started touting it around for distribution. And when the shoot was over, Patrick... Hughes disappeared for weeks into the editing room. The period of post-production on this picture ran for about 12 weeks. He emerged with a film substantial enough to persuade Screen Australia and Arc Light Films to finance its completion. And... Let's see... The assembled cast included actor Ryan Quanton, the star of the hit television series True Blood, who left the TV show's subtropical location in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Jose flew to Melbourne, Victoria, Australia, and was driven up the mountain and emerged camera ready, saturated with blood freezing rain just hours after arrival. And. Let's see. The. Right. Um, Ken Conley, the writer featured in the indelible highlight and signature shot of the horseman going downhill in The Man from Snowy River, 1982, was a farmer, cattle breeder, and horse wrangler in the region of the Victorian high country of the movie is set shot in and around Omeo, Victoria. Conley was director Patrick Hughes' first crew member, not only because of what he could contribute as an individual, but because his involvement automatically opened up the town of Omeo. And... Um, hmm. Right, and some stuff that is... Right, so yeah, to write the movie screenplay, Hughes drove to Omeo, an eight-hour journey from Melbourne, situated just below the snow line of Mount Hotham. He had been there before and it had retained the vast spaces and feeling of isolation. He remembered a perfect setting for the film he was about to write. In this distraction-free environment, he holed up in a local motel for the first draft of the screenplay. And... And he had always loved westerns for the simple fact that there is no subtext to a bullet. There are stories built on the backbone of a moral code. Tales of men whose honor has been tarnished, whose lives have been wrong, men who seek nothing more than the simple taste of revenge. That's exactly what makes the genre such a visceral experience for audiences. And... Let's see... And, yeah, Hughes set out to create a contemporary Western whose themes of revenge, redemption, and sacrifice would play out against the extraordinary landscapes of the Victorian high country of Australia. And... Yeah, and it's been described as a neo-Western action thriller, which makes a lot of sense. And... The, yeah, with the shooting in and around an old mine, gold mining boom town like Omeo, the production was able to capitalize on the stunning beauty of this mountainous region, giving the film an expanse sense of scale and scope. Our landscape is rich in history and conflict, said Hughes, and it occurred to me that not a lot has changed since the 1800s. Sure, instead of horses, we now use cars. Instead of mail, we now have the benefit of mobile phones. But if one were to take away these modern devices, the majority of small rural towns 
are still incredibly isolated. Red Hill taps into the sense of isolation, fusing elements of the thriller genre with that of the Western, all wrote it into a contemporary cop drama. And let's see. So the yeah, so some critic quotes. I swear this is a revenge horror film disguised as a western. And yeah, there's a lot of truth to that. Tom E. Lewis could have been a, an iconic horror figure if this film had been released in released in the 80s. Moreover, this film would be immediately labeled as horror if there were only knives and chainsaws instead of guns. And let's see. Hmm. This critic goes on to say there's an almost non existent connection between the protagonist, Shane Cooper, see what they did there by naming him that, and his family. And yeah, it's basically just. Yeah, it, that, that, that is true. And I think the movie would have been better. And, and frankly, like. His wife has so little agency. Like, I usually say, you know, I think movies should have more female characters, but it's important that they are given agency. Otherwise, it's basically tokenism. Like, you know, the, there's a sense that Shane is protecting, you know, his, his wife is, is pregnant. They're expecting a boy v very soon, and, you know, yeah, that's supposed to, like, there is a reason for that, but for all the, for all the, the agency that the wife character has, you know, might as well have been, like, a vintage, you know, yeah, vintage baseball card or something that he, you know, was very dedicated to protecting. It's just, yeah, and, and I, I don't think it completely did, like, I, I get what the movie is going for. I don't think it completely nailed it with that. And, right, some other critic. I love authentically Australian movies. The sets and settings are all great. Now, he does think that the a lot of the movie feels plotless, Plotless true. I just don't think that's a problem. Not every movie needs equal plot. But he says it's pointless. That I don't really agree. And yeah, he says that it felt like, you know, he, he thought that the, you know, in a number of ways, it's not very realistic. In especially, there, there are some very major ways, which I'll talk about in the spoiler section. And yeah, that that was something that he yeah you know I get why that bothered some people. I think we got to get better at at being open. You know, we we lovers of cinema, we got to get better at being open to like unusual choices in in filmmaking because there is a reason for the the. Yeah, the the stuff in this that isn't completely realistic. And he says, built on a premise that belongs in the 1890s, not 1990s. There was not... Uh, let's see... Uh, right, and uh, yeah, the, the um, original crime was the kind committed 100 years before. And... Yeah, see, I, I think that... It's saying that those things are still a huge problem. You know, it's it's saying that you know we haven't properly that it's it's the kind of thing that hasn't been um what's the word? How do I how do I talk about this without spoiling anything? It's the kind of thing that used to happen and it's still there are still ripples of the the original trauma you know and that's why the movie is set because it wouldn't have been very difficult for them to to basically set it further back but it is distinctly like there are mentions of like there's a there's um 
yeah, there's a mention of a satellite phone, for example, which is not exactly something that they would have in 1890s. So, let's see. And... Right, the... the um, Oh, right, and the, yeah, the, there's a critic who says that, let's see, yeah, it's a flourished yet rather too joyful approach, most notably when Jimmy, standing on an empty street, flips back his coat to reveal a holster gun, providing the cue for a swell of guitars, Ennio Morricone style. It's too cute, undermining the gravity of the situation, and ah, I see what this critic means. Yeah, there is maybe some truth to that. It is perhaps slightly uneven tone, which I would definitely say he... The, the tone is consistent in Expendables 3, so it is something that he realized. He, he went a little too far with. And... Let's see... Yeah, and this person says, Forget the lofty ideals. Red Hill is more convincing when it's low, down, and dirty. And... Yeah, yeah, there is definitely some some truth to that. And let's see the right and yeah, Greg McLean, the director of Wolf Creek and Rogue, attached his name as executive producer, and like his horror competitor Eli, Eli Roth, promotes the emergence of a new filmmaker, Patrick Hughes. And pre who presents an uh, the debut film presents an immense talent in setting shots, cinematography, and storytelling. Hughes com commands a magnificent picture of the Australian high country throughout the movie, while he utilizes impressive shadow techniques indoors. And let's see. And that I think is arguably a spoiler, so I'm going to put it in the spoiler section. And there we go. And... Yeah, um... The film salute, salutes the Western genre with an isolated setting and a sweet rock con country vibe, among other elements. A lone stranger rides on a horse into the darkness of a silent town while everyone hides in fear. It is reminiscent of the Western movies made for pure entertainment. The fun is overshadowed by a thrilling atmosphere, similar to a country for old men. And, yeah, the, the cat and mouse game. There's an abundance of shocking moments to experience. Some are predictable, some are unexpected. And... Let's see... Um, uh, right, I am going to put that in the spoiler section, so there. Mm. Yeah, this person says, one of the problems with Red Hill, on the one hand, is played utterly straight, with even some early humorous shenanigans with the police horse kept pretty low-key. On the other hand, outlandish things and over-the-top acts of violence keep happening. And... Yeah, there, there is some truth in that. And said, instead of letting the action fly and embracing some of the more outrageous aspects of the plot, Panther anyone, the fact that Hughes' tone remains resolutely serious, if not portentous, means that it all starts to feel distinctly silly. And... Yeah, the, the tone is definitely um, an issue. It didn't bother me personally a lot, but there is there are things where it could be better. And, and yeah, based on Expendables 3, he definitely learned from this experience, because that's also a movie that could easily be very tonally uneven. And... 
yeah, some say it, the movie sort of becomes a pseudo slasher, and yeah. And, right, this person says, it's not as if the thing is scary, but I don't think it's trying to be. It's much more focused on action than scares. It's rather atmospheric, though. And I agree. It's it's very tense and suspenseful. It's not, like, outright scary, at least not very much of it. And... Yeah, more than a few glances in the direction of Quentin Tarantino. At one stage, a bad man with a large gun pauses mid-killing spree to activate a jukebox. And and that's also a thing, like, this definitely, you know, there's some inspiration from Quentin Tarantino, but this is not just, like, you know, I... There are people who say that the movie The Boondock Saints, the, the first one, I haven't watched the second one, is basically just him trying to be Quentin Tarantino, and there is definitely some truth to that, and that's not the case here. And... Let's see... It attempts to cultivate a town under siege feel, but uses much more comfortable directing straight shooting thriller moments than he is crafting tense standoffs in and around Red Hill Center. Ah. Perhaps somewhat, but I, I did think that the the tense standoffs were very, very effective. And let's see. Yeah, and and the let's see. Yeah, Tommy Lewis and in uh, hold on, did I get that right? Yes, Tommy Lewis, an indigenous Australian man who previously starred in the starred in the gritty Australian western The Proposition, a steal on Blu-ray, chomps all the scenery he can find. In addition to his badass stoicism, he also has a partially burned off face, which makes him look like Harvey Two Face's slightly more attractive cousin. And yeah, the the makeup effects on him is very impressive, and it's like it's something that you're going to be remembering from this film. You know, it's it's very very clever to give him this sort of distinct. You know, there's a lot of very very visually distinct Western anti heroes and villains. You know, everyone can easily recognize the man with no name. It's it's a it's a very good idea to, to create something so distinct. And yeah, like I don't think I've seen another where it is burned to the face. So uh, yeah. And you know, a lot of, there's a lot of screen grabs in, in text reviews for this movie. The, 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 yeah, a number of these reviews feature one or more screen grabs of scenes where you very clearly see his face. And it's also, Something I really appreciate. I, I was also a little worried that this would maybe have like MTV editing because the 2010s, there were some very badly edited, you know, big movies. So, but but no, he understands, you know, like classic westerns, there is this understanding that it is not necessarily more effective if we only briefly see the the very dangerous gunman. It can sometimes be much more effective if the camera, you know, there, there are like pans across, you know, and and like shots where he's just standing stock still, maybe aiming his gun, you know, in the in the direction of the camera, not directly at the camera, but at someone on the other side of, you know, a character on the other side of the camera. And yeah, it's I, I really, really appreciate someone that is is not afraid to embrace this kind of thing because for sure like you'll have people saying oh come on move move faster but that's not you know yeah and it, you know the movie's nowhere as indulgent as the direction of Sergio Leone but th I don't think that would have worked uh, well for this let's see and yeah, this critic says the structure of the story may have you scratching your head. There's a major character sidelined for a good chunk of the movie's second act. 
everything makes sense in the end with a series of sequences that offer tons of payoff. In addition to Leone, you can tell that Hughes has studied the works of Brian De Palma more than once. And that's also very, very true. Uh, again, you know, someone who is willing to let a shot play out, you know, not obsessed with, no, no, we have to, we have to keep things moving or people will lose interest. Right, and, and his, Shane's wife is apparently Alice Cooper, which is a choice. And, let's see, the... Um, yeah, and, and Shane and local police chief Bill have a homey heart-to-heart -heart down at the town barber shop. And... Let's see... Now... Oh, right, and yeah, this review describes... Jimmy is a frightening figure with his scarred face, black Stetson, and duster. And... Let's see... The... Um... I... Yeah, and, and, you know, at one point we realized things are not adding up. There, there are some questions that, yeah, you know, that a character raises, and by the end you will know the answers to them. And Hughes util utilizes some very cool visuals, beautifully scenic shots to enhance the story. It's also filmed some downright suspenseful and horror-filled moments. And his characterization of Shane with his good and honest, almost bumbling ways was a great decision in order to get the audience on his side within minutes of the picture starting. And... Jimmy is every bit as badass as the most badass villain in any Western film. Absolutely true. And... Let's see. Once a flourishing outback community, Red Hill is an all-white island of outmoded Australian colonial values, marooned somewhere between the prehistoric past, see the tacky Aboriginal diorama in the town's information center, and an urbanized modernity. And let's see the I copied in a lot of reviews, so I'm just going to skim to see how much more... Right, this... yeah. The movie borrows a lot from David Morrell's First Blood. Very, very true. And... Yeah, that's, I want to talk about that, but I am going to put it in the spoilers section. There we go. <clears throat> and, um, let's see. Right, and the the yeah the song on the on the jukebox is described here as a cheesy '70s rock song. Stevie Wright's "Black Eyed Bruiser," which I am definitely going to be listening to again after. In fact, I'm gonna make sure to say there we go and favorite because that yeah I hadn't heard it before, but really really great uh, yeah. It's it's the kind of it's it's one of those things where I would have loved this song if I had heard it completely divorced from context of this movie 
but the context makes it even better. Makes me like it even more. Tight-fisted, well-lensed, and admirably intense little crime thriller. Hugh's goal was to write a Valentine that he could send to both John Ford and John Carpenter. Then I say he succeeded quite well. Very true. And... Let's see... Yeah, and one person points out there's not jump scares. It's, you know... Instead, it is like this, this build-up of, of tension. And let's see. Yeah, this one critic says Red Hill isn't a classic, but it's a damn good time. I do think it is classic, but I th I think that is a you know a lot of people did, did, did will you know have seen it that way, will see it that way, and yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And yes, um, so the the opening does a really really solid job setting up. Like I think it is maybe thirty seconds before you see a person in this, and at first I'm not sure there's anything living in the frame. Like I think maybe the first five to ten seconds. If there was something living in the frame, I don't think I saw it. And that's such a great way, because, like, human beings, when we see a movie, like, we're going to try to glom onto something that's like, okay, you know, there's there's a person, that person maybe looks like me or sounds like me. I guess that's, you know, the this movie is about people who are like me, something like that, you know. So to open it, it's just, it's nature. It's this fantastic panning shot across like mountains and there's like mist like holy crap I it's gotta be at least a little bit away from the the town itself this is the kind of thing that you would like I could see tourists like going there just to see that with their own two eyes you know and yeah it's just just amazing and and like right off the bat there's like there's some there's something off this is not this is not putting me at ease at all you know and the the audio also does a really great job of of this really unsettling kind of kind of thing you know and yeah not long after you do see animal life but it ain't happy it is not in a good mood and like you know, later in the movie, you maybe realize why that was. Because at first, you don't. At first, you do not see what it is that has spooked these animals so much. But it tells you. You know, it's, it's what, what, what is that phrase? It, somehow, the animals are always the first to know. Like, they can tell that there's something wrong. And we, the viewer, can understand, okay, something's wrong. But... I'm not sure any character witnesses this, so so they're you know so so we're spending the first you know as as the movie is setting up all the elements that are going to pay off later, like we're sitting there waiting. Oh, that some something bad is happening. Something bad is going to happen really really soon. And we're just waiting for for the other shoe to drop, you know. And yeah, they they really do a great job. If you If if you're if you're showing this to someone new and they don't mind going through this experiment, try to show them the first twenty minutes of the movie without showing them the very very start, and see if they, you know, I, I you know I doubt that they would be like bored, but it plays different. I'm I'm pretty much willing to bet because the no, the the idea, you know the fact that we know and that's like. It's a it's a very very smart thing for a movie that is at least partially horror to immediately set up there's something off, you know a lot of like really ma major classics like Halloween the thing, just you know there there are some really really just you know from right away you can tell there's something wrong here there's something that shouldn't be the way that it is. Now, I'm not going to give away whether it's a happy ending or a sad ending, but 
the ending does fit with what came before. Yes, I, I do think the ending is quite good. Um, I can see, yeah, so I earlier quoted a critic as saying the way it was shot was anticlimactic. Yes, there that is true. Uh, I let that marinate and it, you know, not the the events, but the way it's shot is is a little anticlimactic. That's true. And let's see, but but yeah, no Deus Ex Machina, no convenient writing, no post credit scene, and that brings us to the characters. And let's. See. Yeah, uh, one critic points out about the character. I'm not going to give away which character, but the more you get to know his backstory, the more human he becomes. Quantum works well as Shane. He stumbles and falls, but through all, it all, he saves uh, some important. Yeah, he he is. Uh, yeah, in the sporting world, Steve Bisley is commanding a senior inspector. And Tommy Lewis is disturbing as the indigenous outlaw figure. His burnt face only adds to the notion of being an other already established through his indigenousness. So, yeah, start, starting with Ryan Quanton as Shane Cooper, the protagonist. And let's see. Um, yeah, this, the, the, um, Pretty quote. I confess I originally watched this to see the performance of Ryan Quantin, how good he matched up to Jason from True Blood. It was shocking to see how good of an actor he is. He is not even recognizable as the same sex-starved idiot hunk. He plays a true gentleman that is an inspiration. His sweetness and dedication and honesty are truly rare and thrown into... Uh, let's see... Yeah. The way he protects his wife who is pregnant is a pure joy to watch. And let's see. the first encounter with Jimmy bristles with tension. And let's see. Um, Red Hill's narrative is more complex than the simple good good ba, good guy bad guy routine that is the usual fare of westerns. Shane is a quite flawed protagonist. Let's see. And yeah, uh, he conveys very well the main hero vibe by being human and vulnerable rather than just a squeaky clean superhero. And Steve Bisley as William Old Bill Jones. And the... Yeah, there, uh, yeah I guess I didn't copy it in. But there was uh, one critic who said, When Steve Bisley talks, you listen. And that's very true. And yeah, like, you know, from right away you can tell that, you know, he is a very hard man. He is not easy to impress. He has opinions, and, you know, I, I really appreciate, like, at, at the very, very start, he comes off as just, like, a, you know, completely, like, you know, just, he doesn't really want anything to do with, with others, but, you know, he, gradually, you, you do see that, you know, he... Like, he maybe judges Shane a lot, but he does try to understand, you know, there is a, a, ah, maybe not so much understand. He wants to know what Shane's deal is, you know, he's not just gonna, like, you know, the, the, he doesn't like that Shane transferred to this town, but instead of just giving him the, the crappy job, you know, he tries to get to know, you know, what what is, why did you transfer here? 
and the first time he asks, you know, what is, you know, yeah, he, he wants details. He wants, you know, the, the, that's when Bill is getting a, a you know, shave and a haircut. And, you know, yeah, he, you know, Shane is not comfortable sharing it. You know, he's going to, he's going to, he's willing to share it with his new commanding officer, but he's not going to share, he's not going to say it in front of this barber that isn't part of the police force, you know. So, you know, Bill, like, signals, or, or wait, no, no, he, he said, I, th I think he just says the guy's name, you know, and the guy walks off. And then they have privacy, you know, that's, like, there's a lot of hard-ass police officials that wouldn't have sent someone away, you know, so, yeah. And, yeah, Tom E. Lewis, R.I.P., as Gerald Jimmy Conway. The, uh, the acting is magnificent, right, credit quotes. The real treasure here is Tommy Lou's performance as the disfigured escape convict Jimmy Conway. He does more with his menacing stare, matter-of-fact walk, unforgiving demeanor, and precision handling of his weapons that, along with the impressive makeup work, make him one of the best characters in recent memory. And, right, I, I want to briefly say, like, yeah, if, if the movie had come out in the 80s, like, people would be talking about, like, can we have, like, Jimmy Conway face off against Jason Voorhees, Freddy Krueger, maybe, you know, it, it really is. And maybe, I, I mean, they probably would have franchised the crap out of it. As it is, Red Hill is completely standalone. I'm, I'm just going to double check, but I'm almost certain there's no, like, no sequel, no... Yeah, and I think that is the the right way. I, I I really really don't think it would be good to have a franchise out of this, but I do think it's really cool that like technically you could like you you know you you want to see more of this guy. And Conway's sly, subtly winning way of combining his killing spree with a quest for those pleasures denied to him behind bars, blithely demolishing the cream cake as one of his cop victims bleeds out, very loudly, I might add, or cueing a favorite rock song on jukebox just prior to shooting up the local watering hole. The various elements here are quite interesting. Let's see... Conway is straight out of the Michael Myers, Jason Voorhees playbook in many ways, an unstoppable, silent killer who returns to the scene of his crimes to wreak further carnage. Conway's disfigured, having been badly burnt during his arrest. Yet he's not going after horny teens or virginal babysitters. Let's see. Yeah. And, yeah, Claire Vanderboom plays Alice Cooper, and I think she does pretty well for what little she's given. You know, like, ba basically... She's just there to, to, you know, inspire, like, we understand why Shane wants to protect her, and we ourselves, you know, it's it's like when a movie shows a cute dog or something, where, like, you better not hurt that, you know, do not mess the, the don't, don't hurt the pregnant woman, uh, you know, but she's really not giving, yeah, it's, it's like, it's like Margot Robbie in the, um, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, you know, clearly talented, basically just there for us to, like, think, oh, I hope nothing bad happens to her. Now, let's see. You know, basically, like, probably the most significant, like, you know, other than the fact that she is currently pregnant, we're told that she was pregnant before and she lost the baby because of stress. So the most important thing that, you know, happened, like, to her character, she had no control over. You know, that's not, like, I, I realize that a lot of people would not empathize as much with her if we were told that, like, she had an abortion in her past or something. But at least it would be a choice of hers to make, but, yeah. 
you know, like, she, yeah, she, she might as well be, like, a, a um, you know, a, a small container of anti, of, of nitroglycerin on a, on a table with a wonky leg. You know, we're like, oh, be careful, be careful, something bad might happen, but there's nothing else to it, and that, I think, is, is too bad. Now, let's see... Um, I think that, yeah, and, uh, yeah, one person says, uh, you know, female characters are handled very poorly, serving only as motivation for a couple of male characters, so, yeah. And, I think that does cover... But yeah, and you know, it's it's one of those cases where like, you know, it's a revenge movie, so there's an expectation that there are multiple victims, uh, you know, to to make it seem bigger. But there's always like, I got a sense of who everyone was, and and usually that sense came within like maybe thirty seconds of of first encountering them, you know, Bill, the first thing is, like, he misrepresents what someone else said to, like, there's this, like, debate at the, the city hall, and, you know, the, apparently, you know, we, we don't hear what the, the woman said, but, you know, as soon as he's done, you know, misrepresenting her, she says, that's not what I said, and you know it isn't. And, you know, then she, you know, I mean, it's basically about, it seems like he's kind of married to the past, and she's like saying, if this town is going to thrive again, we have to, you know, we have to attract new people. You know, we have to make it a place that people want to come visit. And he shuts that down with with absolutely nothing, and a bunch of the people sitting and listening to it cheer him on, you know. So we, we immediately get a sense of who he is and the fact that he is basically representative of a chunk of this town. You know, a lot of these people really don't want things to change, and that's, yeah, you know, and Shane is introduced not knowing where his gun is, and this is his first day in the new precinct kind of thing. So, so you know, that's not great. And the, the yeah, you know, various of the cops, like some of them are more intense than others, but you really get a very quick sense of who they are from just, yeah. Um, let's see. Yeah, and the, the dialogue is, is great. Like usually, th there's some there's some exposition. Usually, it's because there's a at least one character present that doesn't know these things, you know. So just yeah, and that brings us to the cinematography is really really great. Like I already mentioned that shots are allowed to play out, you know, and. It really understands why sometimes the subject is far away from the camera and sometimes the subject is right in front of the camera and uses that very, very well. You know, Tommy is sometimes shown as this Jimmy. Sorry, mixed up the actor and the Jimmy is sometimes shown from afar, like riding into town or this kind of thing where, like, you know, if you're just shooting someone normally arriving at a place, you know, you might shoot in, like, a medium, but no, it's a, it's like a far shot, and that's very, very, yeah, very effective, and the editing is also really solid. Right, I... The cinematography was handled by Tim Hudson. The editing was handled by Patrick Hughes himself, and... Yeah, like, he really understands, like, there is no 
fat on this thing at all. Like everything, and you know, some of that is also um, a script strength, but for sure, like he removed everything that isn't like that. That there isn't a, a point to. Everything matters in this, and yeah. Now, that brings us to the, right, um, hmm, did I not find, I, I apparently didn't copy anything in about, I already mentioned the budget is 700,000, did I not find anything about the box office? Okay, so right here we go. The the worldwide gross was three hundred twenty four thousand four hundred twenty four. So I guess it was overall a financial failure, which is too bad. Like, yeah, I'm not entirely sure why. Maybe it was badly. Uh, what's the word? Badly marketed, because certainly this is. You know, there's a lot of crowd pleasing aspects to this movie. Now, this was yeah, the entire thing was filmed in the the in in yeah, Omeo and um, and the high country of Victoria, Australia. And they really make incredibly good use of like this is this is the kind of thing where like if if nobody if, if this was the first movie if if you showed this to someone that didn't know what Australia was and was just used to watching westerns they would be able to pick up there's something different here because there is there is nature in a number of westerns you know but. That is that is part of the appeal, the the you know open nature, and and this idea of the the early um, yeah you know during the Wild West you had to be able to to negotiate the the terrain and the the dangerous animal life and and such. Now. Yeah, so the, the action, you know, it's not really, I, I wouldn't call it an action movie. It's more of like a thriller, horror, neo-western. But when there is action, it, it is, I, I would say it's more about the tension than the, um, than like big action stuff. But the tension is really, really well done. And like, I'm very impressed with, like, if I if I just looked at like a list of the 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 times that people are attacked in this movie, you know, I might think, you know, wow, that's that's a lot of use of of gun for something that's not like a big action movie where you know, like I, f I feel like if you're watching a John Woo movie. You know the fact that there's a lot of gunplay is, you know, a a that's part of what we want from a movie like that. But a horror movie, and and a, like almost slasher movie, you kind of expect there to be a lot of different tools of of you know, a lot of different weapons. And yeah, like I I'm very very impressed with how well this does with this. Yeah, the the fact that is usually, you know, a lot of the time it's it's guns being used, f despite the the slasher vibe. Now, right, so the yeah, the music is also really really well handled. Um, it's by Dmitry Golovko, and. Oh, and they they teamed up again for the Hitman's Bodyguard. So, yeah, evidently the the work he did composing for this impressed Patrick Hughes enough to to bring him back 
and it's no wonder like this there's some there's some very loving tribute to Ennio Morricone very very like it just 100% works oh and he composed for signs the the short by Patrick Hughes as well so they've actually yeah they they work together on multiple and yeah it's it's no wonder he's incredibly talented I am not really familiar with any of his other work but clearly some of it is yeah one of them is called Oz Girl um, 99% sure that's also Australian then so yeah and something called footballer wants a wife so that's definitely not American right because they call them football players footballer that's like a uh, yeah also Australian anyway yeah, really, really, again, it's this thing of understanding the genre and, and knowing what it should be. Because, you know, the, there's some more, like, modern tension, you know, music also. Right, and one critic actually said the music in the movie is the best part of it, and it definitely is amazing. The... the the score adheres to the slow moving pace in the beginning of the film. The guitars are reminiscent of the small town based ABC drama Sea Change. However, the film score ends in a wonderfully complicated and strong string led rock conclusion. Very true. The the trailers give you a good idea of the, the music. So, you know, they do also spoil some stuff, but you know, if you just like close your eyes or, own, or or focus entirely on the music and or and focus entirely on the music it can that can work now the let's see yeah uh, as far as pacing goes one critic said the affair is generally well paced consistently moving towards its conclusion it's never boring even when it isn't all that engaging there's very little fat here making for a lean somewhat light experience yeah that's that's very very true this movie is an hour and 26 and a half minutes without end credits and 33 minutes with and like I mentioned, you you know, there's not and there's there's music over the end credits. It's not bad, and it is uh, yeah. If you watch the first thirty or forty minutes, then you'll know if the rest of the movie is for you or not. And yeah, so the the best elements, it's it's a tie between the neo western horror mix and the the commentary and the way it delivers it. Ah, uh, yeah, this is the part where I, I'm supposed to say, what's the worst thing about the movie? So I force myself to say something negative about movies that I love. I mean, yeah, there are a couple of times where the movie isn't completely engaging, and then you have the 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 way that female characters are basically just there to motivate male characters that's yeah now uh, the worst thing according to but but yeah so to be clear i don't think it's a, a really big deal you know so the yeah the worst thing according to others some people didn't like the mix of genres and some were frustrated by some of the cops being kind of yeah the word some user is incompetent and yeah so the thing I was most worried about you know not everyone's first film is great but yeah this is a very pro like if this had been the first thing that I'd watched by Patrick Hughes even if I didn't already know The Expendables 3 and you know being attracted to the the hitman's bodyguard films yeah the the um, let's see what's the word this this would make me interested in his other work 
and so so yeah exceeded my expectations and the thing I was most looking forward to was more Oz exploitation and yeah very very happy that I watched this now the trailers do give at least a little too much away but do also give you a really good idea of what the movie is like now cover and poster don't really give don't don't give too much away and give you a good idea of what the movie is like and that brings us to Rotten Tomatoes where it is certified fresh 79 percent 68 reviews 54 of them fresh an average rating of 6.50 out of 10 and the consensus is though its attempts to rework genre conventions may fall flat with some Red Hill is a beautifully shot, tightly paced thriller that marks a strong debut for director Patrick Hughes. Now, it is um, rotten with audiences. 57% based on over 2,500 ratings, an average rating of 3.3 out of 5. And on Metacritic... It has a 62 out of 100 based on 9 reviews, 5 of them positive, 4 of them mixed. And let's see. Yeah, one person said that, uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's stuff that I've already talked about and it has a 6.7 out of 10 from users nine ratings five positive two mixed two negative no reviews by users and IMDB it has a 6.3 out of 10 based on what does that say eight eight thousand nine um, yeah, I mean, it looks like 8,000. Um, oh, yeah, so almost 9,000, apparently. 8.9 thousand. Anyway, so the, yeah, 27.6% gave it 7, 247 gave it 6, 148 gave it 8, 108 gave it 5. I find it, I, I think it's, wild to give this less than a than a five but to use their own 5.5 give it four 4.9 give it 10 4.8 give it nine 2.7 gave it three 2.5 gave it one 1.7 gave it two so 2.5 percent that makes it sound like that that sounds more like a um, um, moral objection than a particularly realistic like, that does not sound like you weighed all the different elements of the movie up against each other and you thought everything was that bad, but yeah. Um, I am going to talk a little bit about, because there are some, let's see, yeah, there are some, some, there was some animal cruelty. And the yeah, so so yeah, it's I'm I'm not saying that you're necessarily wrong if you have you know obviously if the thing that you hate about the movie is that you know if there's some criticism of colonialism then you know fuck you anyway um. Yes, so the on IMDb there are 79 user reviews, 51 without spoilers, and let's see, I, I believe I read all of them, yes. And yeah, so the, the 79, you know, the, there were, yeah, five of them, Voted one out of ten. Five, yeah, 
another 5, 2 out of 10, another 5, 3 out of 10, 8 gave it 4, 5 gave it 5, 14 gave it 6, 8 gave it 7, 14 gave it 8, 6 gave it 9, and 7 gave it 10. So, yeah, that's about evenly. You know, some some people who felt compelled to write reviews really, really didn't like the movie. And again, some of the issues they bring up, I do. Yeah. Now, yeah, you know what? If, uh, yeah, the animal cruelty is my biggest problem with this movie. So, the, um, let's see, the uh, special, special effects was what I wanted to, there's, it's not a very, it's not an effects heavy movie, but what there is, is convincing, and this is the kind of thing where, you know, I've, I've seen movies that try to pull off, like, gunplay, and then they don't have, like, um, what's, um, crap, um, when the gun fires, the, the, I forget what it's called in English, but the, the gun on, you know, the, the, you should be able to see when a when a gun is is fired when it's that kind of gun at least, and like the the blood and gore effects are also completely convincing. Yeah, some really excellent stunt work as well. There's this part where someone takes quite the fall and like holy crap, you know it's good that we can do this kind of stuff safely now because otherwise I would be very very concerned for for this guy. But yeah. And yeah, if you know, if violence is a is very important to you, and I, I do think you know, for this kind of thing, you know, it is very much about this revenge spree. So yeah, the fact that there is some focus on the violence does make sense. And yeah, like you know, it's not the most gory, violent thing I've ever seen, but there is some some choice stuff that really, really hits you. You know it. Like, I, I quoted Hughes as having said, visceral. And... Yeah, and the, the swearing tends to inform, like, you know, if it's a... If, if someone is swearing, it's either because that's just... They're, they're a kind of crass person... Or it's, you know, and or it's because they are in a very intense situation. So that is, let's see, yeah, um, yeah, I, th this, I rate this eight revenge sprees out of ten, and yeah, uh, I wouldn't rule out watching this again later today. The the streaming service said I have it for like 48 hours. Uh, free. It's through my library. Yeah, I have it for 48 hours. I I might watch it again. It's really, really thoroughly impressive. Just, yeah. Now, let's see. The... But yeah, and it absolutely holds up. Like I mentioned, you know, some movies from the 2010s, yikes, but this is a really, really great one. Uh, you know, it's it it hasn't aged badly, though, you know. It's only been 13 years, but there's some movies from, from back then that, uh, yeah. And let's see. I, I do hope that more people realize it exists. Um, right, I actually, I forgot to mention uh, there's only 91 links to reviews in the IMDb external reviews section and you know, I was able to read 55 of them. You know, the links worked and they were in English. Yeah, I, I hope that in the future more people come to realize this. And, you know, considering that the director is still working, you know, there's a there's a chance that people are going to go back and watch his earlier work. And, yeah, I think this is one that they absolutely, a lot of people will, you know, really love. And, yeah, 
um, worst to best, including this, all the all four Ozploitation movies that I've watched. Gone, Daybreakers, Mad Max 1, and Red Hill. This is my new favorite Ozploitation, and yeah. And I'm not sleeping on Mad Max 1. That is still a really, really solid movie. Now, the... That brings us to the spoiler section. So, starting with notes taken while watching this. And these will be in chronological order. You could think of it as a running commentary, live tweeting, or the like. Some analysis, some jokes. So, let's see. So yeah, we're, we're introduced to Shane, and the first thing is that he, you know, he has misplaced his gun, which, you know, right away tells us, okay, so he's not a white supremacist cop. They would never in a million years, they sleep with their gun, actually, in, in both senses of the term. And, you know, he he shows up at the, at the police station, you know, I, I did like the thing of, you don't even know where you're going to. No. And, you know, he goes in and they, you know, because it's such a small town, they literally have one of those maps and it's just like, okay, so, you know, here's that thing, here's the, you know, and yeah, he, he walks in and the guy is sleeping at the desk, you know, for, uses the, the bell, the guy wakes up and, you know, we immediately get a little, you know, are you going to tell me where I need to go to get to the, you know, oh, right, city boys. <laughs> It was just like, yeah, I mean, that right there tells you they are really not used to people coming in from the outside. He he's he forgot for a second. Oh, right. If you don't live here, you need directions. Just, you know, yeah, that that right away tells you, you know, and it's, yeah, like he's he's just this kind of, you know, he's not. He doesn't seem like an incredibly bad guy, the, the guy at the front desk. He's just, you know, yeah. And, and you know, as, as they're talking, you know, Manning shows up and he's like, you know, on the phone, on, on his cell phone, that is horseshit, I did not say that! And, you know, walks, yeah, and, and like, oh, so, Manning, this is Shane, he's new. Ugh. And he walks off. Shane is in a it's, uh, Manning is in a great mood today. Just, you know that that's like usually he's he's throwing around stuff and and shouting obscenities much more aggressively than he was right now. Let's see, and you know he's like, um, "Are you aware that there's a horse right uh, you know in the in the parking lot?" Yeah, that's old Beth. She lives here. And, not to put too fine a point on it, but she'd never misplace her gun. And, let's see. Yeah, we right away learn that, you know, Bill looks to the past as being better. And, yeah, and there are, there are multiple instances early on where someone says, you won't tell on me that I you know, did this thing that I wasn't supposed to kind of thing. So, you know, right away we get the sense that, you know, they're not, they're not used to things being super intense. We'd be having a very different conversation if you were dead. For one thing, it would require a Ouija board. And, yeah, you know, Shane was himself shot because, you know, he was in front of this junkie and he couldn't shoot a kid with a gun, much less a camera. So the, the you know, and, and this thing, you know, he said maybe he needed help. And and Bill is like, help. You know, so, so yeah, it is, you know, right away we get this sense that there's something, you know, and... The TV shares the details of Jimmy, and, and you know we we get build up to. I I really appreciate all the build up to Jimmy before the 
and let's see the yeah we're told about the the panther and Ryan Quanton you know gets atop a horse and millions of True Blood f fans find themselves imagining that they are that horse and yeah I, I you know it's quite good when the plan is laid out and Bill is like okay this is gonna be terrible so you there you there you there get somebody get Shane a gun you know and I love the guys like you know this they are really not welcoming to to outside like he's gonna be part of the police force and they have that much of an issue with just yeah um you know to be fair forgetting your gun on your first day not a great first impression but the you know and and one of them is like bill aren't you being a little bit you know, are are is, is this not you catastrophizing? Aren't aren't you kind of freaking out over the you know? And Bill, you know, delivers the trailer line. You know, if Jimmy Conway's coming to this town, he'll he's bringing hell with him. And let's see, and and yeah, you know, um, Shane is sitting in the car waiting for you know he's thumbing through a book of names for baby boys and see and that's also you know that's why the the you know let's see I think is it maybe the second time they meet um, that let's see I think at first Jimmy does try to shoot Shane but misses which tells you that he is not deserving of the revenge that you know Jimmy is doling out and then Jimmy sees the book and that's you know yeah he's not gonna you know that's what they did to you know they they took away his baby boy before the the boy was born he's not gonna take away some other baby boy's father but you know the moment that you just see him sitting with the book I mean yeah he's He's excited. He's going to be a father soon. That's a very normal thing to, you know, yeah. And and absolutely love seeing a movie that says there's nothing wrong with men being excited about becoming a parent. You know, there's so much media that says, ah, that's a girl's thing. Only girls want to reproduce and, and have, you know, just... Like I'm not 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 everybody wants it. Men and not all men, not all women. But there's absolutely nothing wrong with being excited about having a, a child as a man. Let's see. And yeah, you know he like nobody thought that that Jimmy would be coming that way and he you know he stops the the car and I do also really appreciate you know the, his wife calls and you know she, yeah she explains you'll never guess what they're doing in the conference room the gun was under the towels and I was also like should she be unpacking herself if she's super pregnant but okay I mean towels those are gonna be necessary so you know presumably like the you know the box was in a place where she could reach it without having to carry it around she opened it to to hang up the towels and there was the gun right underneath and and that was probably like maybe they packed in a hurry or maybe he was thinking towels that's going to be the first thing we unpack the gun should be right there you know some something like that so but you know when he's like, you know, oh, okay, duty calls. You know, she's not like, ah, they, they. There's so many movies where if a man is trying to hang up on a, a woman that he cares about, she's going to get angry about it, and it's just such a ridiculous stereotype. Now, but but yeah, super tense when you know he he walks up. So yeah, I, I forget what what did. I, he says something to the old couple. I, f I forget exactly what, but, you know, and and look at them, and it's like, oh, no, oh, something's definitely wrong, and Jimmy jumps out, and he's got the gun, you know, and the, the I'm, I'm going to go ahead and real quick, because there was a, one, one critic said 
that the the you know it, it is Quantin's fault that you know Shane's reluctance to kill means many others die. Let's see, but you know we we learn that Jimmy like it is like. If you, I, I don't personally agree with uh, violent revenge. I, I understand, like, I'm, I've always been more of a supporter of restitutional justice over retributive justice. But it's a Western. Of course it's going to be retributive justice. And, like, if you watch this entire movie and you don't think that, like, if someone in this movie deserves to die, it is definitely the cops that beat Shane, beat Jimmy, raped his wife, killed his wife, and then arrested him for the crime they committed. You know, it's just, but, but yeah, this is, I'm, I'm not saying, I don't know if this critic is racist or if they're just, like, I, I get that in real life, you know, you, you wouldn't want someone to surrender their gun when they're face to face with someone who has a gun but anyway the let's see but but yeah you know it is like he there is this yeah this this critic also does say Shane may be the intuitive type and you know that i think that is it like he can tell that Jimmy is not He's not out to kill innocent people, basically. And I honestly, I think if Shane had tried to, to shoot Jimmy, he would have missed and Jimmy would have killed him in self-defense. I don't think that Shane was in any position to actually prevent, you know, it's, it's this thing of, it is basically like supernatural, he's, it's, it's, yeah, it's supernatural retribution, you know. Jimmy is impossibly, you know, he's, he's basically impervious. You know, he, uh, either that cop who fired, like, I think he emptied a revolver, so he fired, like, six shots, very, very close, like, almost point blank, I think. And either Jimmy didn't take any damage from the, I, in, you know, my headcanon is the bullets missed because bullets in this movie have a sense of justice if they're fired at someone who doesn't deserve to die they're gonna miss if they're fired at someone who does they're gonna be on target you know that's why the the only time that Jimmy is seen to miss is when he shoots at Shane and you know ultimately Shane doesn't that that was something I had you know based on like the um what's it called based on some reviews that hinted at the ending i thought that the ending of the movie was shane shooting jimmy but ultimately you know that's not and and you know the when he when jimmy is shot there at the end you know his revenge spree is over he has killed everyone still alive responsible for or, or everyone is dead that you know he didn't shoot the guy who hanged himself but he did you know every they're all dead and I don't think even, like, when, when Jimmy is lying there dying and he says, we were having a baby boy, you know, I don't think he does still want to live. I think he just wanted to make sure that they died, you know, so, yeah. Let's see that. So the next thing is... And yeah, you know, when he is, when, when Jimmy is finishing that other cop's dessert, which was also a great little, like, okay, so there must be another cop here other than Barlow, because, you know, why would Barlow put the, the like, if he's still eating it, he's not going to just leave it on the table while he's in another room doing his job. He's going to, like put it in, you know, wrap it in tinfoil and put it in the refrigerator or something, you know, but so, so yeah, clearly there's someone else and opens the door to the John and there he is and he shoots him. And he also sees the, the plan 
on the, you know, so now he knows their positions, so just, yeah. And, yeah, we find out that the old couple were left alive by Jimmy, you know, he, he siphoned off the gas, so they're, they're stuck there, but, you know, eventually someone is going to come and, and help them. Uh, you know, he wants them out of the way. He could easily, they would be completely powerless to stop him if he tried to hurt them, but he didn't hurt them at all. Both of them were still alive, you know, they, they like fell asleep, which is also like, you know, what else are you going to do? Like, you're just waiting for someone to, to come by. Now, let's see. Yeah, and, and the the jukebox, super tense and suspenseful scene. And Jimmy glares at the racist display, but it's also that he can see the sniper. You know, I just love, like, his close-up and, and his eyes, like, you know, like he's, he's focusing intently on, and yeah, he sees the sniper in the, in the reflection of the glass and shoots him and he, you know, another cop runs Jimmy over and misses him with the shots. And then the radio gives away the position. Like, for sure, these cops are not very good at stopping Jimmy, but I don't think it's supposed to be, oh, they're just super incompetent, small-time cops, so much as they deserve it. You know, there is that thing of, if you do something wrong, then the weight of the guilt will drive you to make mistakes until you pay for what you did wrong, kind of thing. I, th I believe that's what's going on here, which, you know, there's some psycho some truth to that, like psychologically, and sometimes it's just, a, you know, something we like to think in, in fiction and such, but I believe that's what's going on. And... Yeah, Barlow completely freaks out, and then dies very, very silently. That... I gotta say that I, I like it didn't like completely ruin the movie for me, but it felt a little weird. Like you know, one of, like for a while he's just freaking out, very, very hyperverbal, and then like a minute passes or something. You know, they they manage to quiet him down. Minute passes, and then one of the cops is like, "Barlow's dead," and it's like, okay, just like don't get me wrong, he was definitely he was very very badly wounded, but like from from being. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I just, I guess I felt like maybe there should have been, like, a shot of him after. Because I'm almost certain there wasn't a, they didn't show him after he apparently died. And, yeah, we see that, you know, Jimmy managed to trick them into shooting the wrong guy in the, in the car. You're not gonna die. I'm a vampire, I'll turn you. I know. He means you're not going to die right now. And it looks like maybe Shane escapes Jimmy, but nope. And falls over from the blood loss, becomes a hostage, and Jimmy goes to the grave of his wife, who, thinking about it, I'm not even sure, was she even given a name? Ellen. Ellen Conway, according, played by Jada Alberts. Alberts? you know, I'm not sure that... Oh, actually, hold on. I think the, the guy who, you know, who suicided, I think he might have said, we came for him and Alan. Now, the... But yeah, you know, he, he gets the dirt and wipes on his, his... some of his face to, like, you know, that's... He's doing it for her and sees the, the baby names book. And... Yeah, and the the let's see. Yeah, the various cops some, you know, th threaten Shane to not go for backup. And let's see. Yeah, and and they knock out Shane. He gets knocked out a lot in this movie, and he sees the panther. 
which is of course this thing of you know the the my interpretation I should say is that the panther and Jimmy try are are trying to to you know ex like they're trying to prevent things from moving too far away from the the natural state you know and yes there shouldn't be a panther in Australia although apparently that the legend that one of the characters is it Gleason I, f I forget tells Shane that is actually some that is an actual Australian legend and apparently there is there's there's no proof that there's any truth to it but you know yeah and and the CG on it is fine. It's not like, like by 2010 standards, it's perfectly fine. And they're you know smartly like it's kept in the dark. It's not they don't focus so much on it that it's like distracting. But but yeah, you know the the panther sees Shane but doesn't go for him but does attack that other you know and yeah you know it is this this thing of because because that's what we learn near the end the reason that they, you know, attacked Jimmy and his wife was the, you know, they were against the, the railroad. Now, then we have the, yeah, they, they can't get the, the car going, so there's a horse and does manage to call for backup using the satellite phone finds Gleason hanging out and we get the flashback and he wrote down you know the signed confession of the and that was also a thing just briefly like I saw one critic say wow so I guess everyone in town was just in on this crown crime well demonstrably no the old couple were you know were not or wait were they from a different town Oh, actually, I guess maybe they were from a different town. Anyway, anyway, not everybody in Australia was in on the crime. Maybe a lot of, maybe most people in the in the town itself were. Anyway, let's see. And yeah, Shane gets his own gun, does not tell the wife the truth, and you know, is, uh, you have a you have a cut on your face. Yeah. That's definitely the only part of me that's been bleeding today. Um, totally don't check under my under my jacket, you know. And ah, oh, you know, we're wrangling cattle, which you know, yeah, you could you could get very very slightly hurt doing that, but not like badly. And yeah, Jimmy got the harpoon and the boomerang from the display at the tourist, you know, information center, and just, yeah, absolutely loved seeing him use those. See, that's definitely a thing, like, if, th if th there was, like, a series of films where an aboriginal was going around getting revenge, you know, for sure he should be using stuff like boomerangs and harpoons. And... Jimmy versus Bill, and there's a massive standoff. And we get the full flashback. The reinforcements show up, and yeah, very, very tense, you know, climactic scene. I, I really, really love that it's not that Shane, you know, Shane does finally fire a gun. It's not that he's incapable of it, it's that he doesn't shoot people that he shouldn't. I mean, Obviously, it's messed up that he got shot by this junkie kid, but that doesn't mean that the junkie kid deserves to die or deserves to be shot at the very least. You know, like he said, maybe he needed help. You know, and, you know, I'm not going to claim that, like, obviously, there's a pretty decent chance things got much, much worse for him after he shot a cop. But the, the you know, yeah, the movie's not about him. He's, he's collateral damage, so that the movie... But, you know, yeah, Shane is capable of firing a gun, but he's he appears incapable of shooting the wrong person, basically. And, 
yeah, really, really love that that's the, you know, there's a lot of stories like this where the ending would just be that Shane shot Jimmy. But instead, he realizes that he shouldn't, and he shoots the, you know, he, he makes sure that Jimmy is able to kill the the last uh, couple. Now, and I I will maybe also say the the very very ending, like again, not saying that the events were anticlimactic, but the fact that Jimmy stands there because at first it's just him and Bill. You know, he it seems like he could just easily finish Bill off. But then the other two show up with guns, and then Shane shows up to basically help ensure that Jimmy, you know, doesn't die before killing the people, before all the people responsible are, are dead. Which is also, you know, one of the guys rides up and literally says, I don't know what I love, what I'll enjoy most, raping your wife or killing you. Which just right there tells you, holy shit, this guy. Yeah, um... I don't think in a real life anybody deserves to die, but if they did, he would be one. Holy shit. What a fucking monster. And, you know, I it did feel a little bit... I, I just, I wish, I think just a um, another, a, a quick rewrite of the scene would have, you know, if, if the... I just, I don't understand why he doesn't immediately shoot Bill. And it basically, it doesn't seem motivated by anything other than that, you know, basically Patrick Hughes wanted there to be the, you know, this, yeah, wanted the, for there to be the two men on horse, Shane, Billy, and Jimmy, all in the one scene. And I just, I think that if, if maybe Jimmy wasn't introduced into the scene right away, like, maybe, let's see, yeah, if the two guys on horse were right there, and then, like, they, they hear a noise behind them, and they turn to face, and then when they turn to face back, Jimmy is there pointing his gun at Billy, who's on the ground. They get, you know, they point their guns at Jimmy, and then Shane points their gun at, you know, shows up, and, and then the scene plays out. That that would be my my one change, but, yeah. That is it for this section. So that takes us to the final section. Notes taken before watching. So let's see. Yeah, a couple of IMDb trivia quotes. Australia has no panthers. There is no urban legend stating a panther escaped from a traveling circus fled into the woods. There have been several sightings and even a footprint found, but no concrete evidence of a panther has ever been found. For the scene where the panther enters the barn, there was, of course, no panther, as it was a CGI creation. Instead, director Patrick Hughes got down on his hands and knees to give Ryan Quanson something to react to. That right there tells you he does not have a frail ego. Like, imagine the director getting on his hands and knees and going around. Like, that's, like, it reminds me of when, like, David Cronenberg, I know, I, I bring this up way too often, I swear I'm going to make it quick. David Cronenberg, when they were going to make The Fly, he was testing out this, you know, basically to prove that it would work. Because they wanted the character to walk on the ceiling, that's not something you can actually do. So they had to have a rotating set so that the camera could make it seem like, oh, he's walking on the ceiling, when in reality he's just walking on the floor, you know. And instead of just doing it, he put on, like, this thing on this head. I forget if he was also wearing a costume, if he went the full, like, like that early Blues Brothers clip, where they, they're wearing, like, bee costumes. But, but yeah, you know, and he's got the, the antenna, and right once he's proven that it works, you know, he does the thing that the, the, that flies do with the, with, is that with the antenna? Anyway, anyway, but, you know, just, like, I really respect the director who will, you know, act out the role of an animal so that, you know, for, for the sake of the production, that just, you know, yeah. 
like imagine working on a movie and the director is like oh wow you know you're totally starstruck and then he does something like that to really put you at ease and say no, I'm I'm just one of you I'm a, I'm a human being just like any of you now let's do this thing you know cuz you really the ideally you'll want to have a good relationship with with you know between the director and the cast and the crew Tommy Lewis has just one line of dialogue in the entire film Tommy Lewis shot to fame over 30 years early in French PC's The Chant of Jimmy Blacksmith. His character here is essentially a continuation of Jimmy Blacksmith. His character in the movie is actually called Jimmy. It just has a slightly different spelling. And I realize I said some of that in the non-spoiler section, but the thing about the character being a continuation, that I did consider a spoiler. And let's see... Um, Yeah, so the this the about the about the animal cruelty. The yeah, the, this movie um Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to directly quote um yeah, the horses in this movie were made to race down the concrete streets. One slightly almost slips, and you can see the sparks under the heels from the horseshoes impacting negatively with the street. I loathe this kind of callous disregard for animals. And that is, yeah, um, I really wish that they had taken care to not do that. And, right, one critic says, At first I thought maybe this does the racist old thing of making the indigenous people the villains, but it's more complicated than that. And that is a lot of old westerns. Th those are the ones I try to avoid. You know, the ones where, oh, it's Native Americans who are, you know, yeah, made out to be these awful people when they were just protecting their land. And if you actually look at the history, like, they try to just trade and have a good relationship with the, the you know, early uh, uh, pilgrims, I guess they're called. You know, it, it, was the, it was the white people coming to America who thought that there needed to be, you know, a war between them. And... Let's see. Um, yeah, and and let's see. Yeah, fans of classic and semi-classic Australian American westerns, action and horror films in particular, will have plenty of references to chew on in Red Hill, starting with the implacable Conway's Michael Myers slash Terminator like near indestructibility. The fact that Conway is Aboriginal and the rest of the cast is of European descent is not exactly coincidental either. And let's. See. Yeah, and the, the, you know, at least for American viewers, the parallels seem to make it mandatory that if the film is ever remade in America, Conway will be Native American. And let's see. The scariest part of Red Hill is it was made in 2010, and it was so prescient about where white attitudes were headed. Not saying there was no racism prior to this movie's release, that's ridiculous. It's undeniable over the past decade racism has become more prevalent than ever, despite our insistence global society is changing its old ways. There's a glaring hypocrisy in the attitudes of certain white characters in the movie that rings so true about real-life whites. They have no time for indigenous Australians trying to preserve land. They come in bulldozing traditional values and sacred ground, and then they're upset when a city boy, like Shane Cooper, moves in from the city unaware of th how things work in their tiny town. Just like today, white Americans, Australians, etc. complain about immigrants coming into their country when they themselves were the original immigrants. There's this excellent... Um, let me think. I, I will have it momentarily because it is, uh, what's that movie called again? It's The Hunchback of Notre Dame from 1939. There is this excellent quote that I really, really love about the... Here we go. Um, yeah, it's that's about racism against the Roma people, and the the yeah, you know the 
the the Roma are being denied entry, and the you know they're being told you're Roma, you're foreigners, and he responds, foreigners, you came yesterday we come today it's such a perfect because that's it exactly like there are like the vast majority uh, crap it's been a while since i read so i don't remember the exact details but a huge amount of the people living today their ancestors moved to where they live today they didn't they weren't always living like if you go far back enough and at that point it's like well why wouldn't you let immigrants into the country if the, the you know the only essentially okay so there's yeah let me let me just briefly there's a couple of arguments against immigration they will be you know dangerous which is something like to be you know you you do have to you know you can't let just absolutely anybody in. I, I forget, I think I read something about a really excellent checking system, but I, I yeah, um, you know, so, so that's, yeah, that's one, then there is, they might, you know, maybe they have some sort of disease that we don't, okay, so, you know, test them, you know, to, if, if, like that that's that's actually that's a really really good argument if, like if you think that there's something about them that like it it sounds to me like okay so you should help them then like why why would you send away people who might need your help like i'm sorry are we are we a democratic country that like you know thinks that every person has an inherent worth or are we a dictatorship that thinks that uh, our people are superior, you know? Okay, fair enough. That's a false dichotomy, but I'm just saying, like, just, yeah. Um, I'm Danish, and we also, I, I really wish that we would let in more immigrants, but we do at least take some steps in, in the right direction, but, yeah. Let's see, I feel like there's one more... Um, Right. The, the and, and I think these are the three. The third argument I've heard is their ways might be different from ours in ways that we can't accept. And to be clear, like there's you know absolutely I don't think that we should support, for example, you know marriage between um you know yeah um, a minor and well yeah it, it, marriage that involves the underage at all should not be you know but. That's not just an immigrant thing, you know, I, I just, just yesterday I watched a video where, like, there was this, yeah, yeah, it was one, it was, um, what are they called? It was one of the, um, videos by Some More News, um, where, where, you know, this white Republican was saying, you know, there's nothing wrong with marriage between someone who's underage and someone, you know, older than, you know, which just, yeah, wow. Um, you know, that's the funny thing. Frequently when you see, like, white people saying, oh, those immigrants, they do things in a way that we, you know, they have these values that, that we don't share. You know, often if you look at it, it's like, yeah, it's stuff that we used to do, though. So really what you're upset about is that they, you know, it's just... I think it's important to have a historical perspective, is all. But but yeah, um, if you think they have values that, you know, for sure, there are things that we shouldn't accept. But if they're refugees, if, you know, if, if they... A lot of these people, they're not looking to change... I'm not saying all, but a lot of them are not looking to change the country they moved to into the country that they left. They're looking to... You know, they, they want to assimilate, and then you have people refusing to let them assimilate. Now, let's see. Um, right, so back to critic quotes. It's from this colonial perspective which Red Hill works best. We discover white indifference and capitalist greed led to the plot's violent events. Later, secrets are revealed. 
Jimmy Conway was trying to protect the natural landscape and indigenous space of high country Australia. When he stopped a big land development, preventing new economic growth in Red Hill, the white men, led by the law, got together a posse and took misguided revenge on him, during which he killed some men. This put Jimmy in jail, then years later he breaks out for his own revenge. Hughes explores many of the effects of white capitalist greed. For example, it's obvious Jimmy experiences the worst effects, but Cooper's an example of a white man, guilty by association, who nearly gets fatally caught in the web of deceit his new colleague spun long before his arrival. Red Hill does good by not making Cooper into a white savior. He does try to aid Jimmy in getting revenge, though in the end this doesn't go as planned. And Jimmy is never once seen as a passive character in need of saving. Very true. <coughs> Let's see, and <clears throat> yeah, and the, there's this this critic gave this a three out of ten, and uh, yeah, he says the movie is little more than a remake of Bad Day at Black Rock from 1955. Both are way too woke for me. A, a western from 1955 is too woke. Wow. And let's see. Yeah, he said this. You know, Red Hill is so over the top woke. I was just barely able to watch the last half hour, and then only to see, out of idle curiosity, how they ended. I mean, I guess because it's the. Let me see if I can guess. Because the white cops are incompetent. The Aboriginal is effective against them and because they you know did something horrible to him I guess but like do you not think that it's important to be aware of how horrible like you know the the You know, sad as it is to think about, white people colonizing various places around Earth always included really horrific things like rape, murder, and enslavement done to the indigenous people. Now, let's see. Yeah, and the. Let's see. Um. Yeah, Jimmy's dispatch of two of the nastier posse members with an aboriginal spear and, yes, a boomerang from a historical display is how Hugh Hughes gives the movie a lot of Australian specifics. The boomerang, in particular, is a masterstroke conveyed through an off-screen sound effect before it slaps into Jimmy's hand. That's, yeah, that was amazing. And, yeah, uh, one critic said, I would like to know which police academy the officers attended. They poorly execute their tactics, usually give their position away. I would not mind if there is a blundering officer or two on the force, but it is ridiculous to have a town run by blundering men who do not know how to subdue a suspect effectively. The dialogue is cliche. There are moments where I would prick my ears up and grin in admiration. One of my biggest complaints of the movie is the addition of a legend which I found to be irrelevant to the storyline. Comes out of nowhere, sets itself in the middle of all the chaos without explanation, without... Worst of all, the question is never answered. Yeah, it's, it kind of sounds to me like this guy just did not want to try to actually parse what the movie is, is saying. Like, yeah, I already talked about, you know, the stuff with the, the cops incompetence and what my interpretation of the legend... I don't think the legend was perfectly handled, but I really don't think what, like the, the, I, I suppose one thing, like, is it really there? And I don't know, you know, that, that would be of a question to, I don't think it's supposed to be. I think, because this is after Shane wakes up after having been knocked out. I think, like... You know, he is a, an intuitive character, you know, he is a character with good intuition, and, yeah, basically, like, the, the, um, you know, because he's still not, you know, he's not completely awake yet, you know, notice that nobody else actually sees the, the panther, 
he is, you know, in that state, he is like the, the, yeah, he's, he, the fact that Jimmy's revenge is justified, you know, so, and, and aided supernaturally means that, you know, it is like this, this panther surviving, even though it shouldn't be able to. Now, yeah, so a number of people were frustrated by the cop not being able to hit Jimmy and him hitting them. I feel like people who leave reviews on movies don't try, to, you know, often don't try to fully engage with it. Like, we're so used to good accuracy in a lot of movies that they just get annoyed that they don't get that instead of considering that there's a reason for it. And yes, I will grant there are many movies that have terrible gun accuracy where it's only to make the movie longer. I really do not think that the, the, yeah. Let's see. And I, I think it's important that Shane doesn't die and that, like, it's not that Jimmy does nothing that hurts. Uh, you know, he, he does, he, he hits him, he knocks him out and, like, uh, you know, ties him up and such. But he doesn't, like, you know, he, he doesn't kill him and he doesn't, like, it's, you know, like, uh, by the end of the movie, Shane has not been, like, he's not going to die from his injuries, he's not going to be, you know, disabled from his, in as, a, as a result of his injuries, you know, because that would not be just, the, the, you know, by the end, justice is basically done, I, so, so, yeah, you know, and, the, um, let's see, yeah, you know, the people, the, the police who do end up killing Tommy, and again, by the end, Jimmy, the actor is Tommy, the character is Jimmy, by the end, you know, like, Jimmy has kind of become a monster, you know, he is, like, and it, it is that thing of, like, if, if you are killing people, then eventually, it, you know, you yourself will die violently. Uh, uh, live by the sword, die by the sword, basically. You know, but, but yeah, the cops who do end up killing Jimmy did not participate in, you know, what, what was that thing? Like, oh, it's, a, it's an hour's drive away. So they, you know, the, it was only the people of the small town who participated in the, the crime against Jimmy and Ellen. And thus they are able to, the, the, the city cops are able to, to kill Jimmy. So that is it for this video. Hit me up in the comments. Let me know what is your favorite neo-western. Uh, you know, do you think, you know, yeah, what, which, what's your favorite Ozploitation movie? And the, the, yeah, you know, what, what movie do you think best uses the Australian, you know, um, traits unique to Australia to, to give a movie a personality, even if some of the plot elements are inspired by, for example, American movies? If you like this video, please thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell. There should be a link to my main channel page. One, two more links to stuff like relevant playlists, a suggested video for you to watch on the screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on a movie, and one talking about my spoiler thoughts on the most recent episode of the current Disney Plus live action Star Wars show, which these days is The Mandalorian. And I've also, you know, I've, I've done vlogs on pretty much everything Star Wars that I've ever, you know, yeah, all of, all of the movies, I'm working my way through the, the animated shows, you know, almost done with Clone Wars, the Clone Wars, and, you know, a couple of the games as well. And recently, the View and Thoughts videos tend to come out very similar to this one. In other words, if you want more videos like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back catalog as well as catch my next week. I hope you enjoyed watching, as I enjoyed watching and recording, and I will catch you next time.